Praise the Lord, everybody. If you love the Lord, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm honored to be here this morning, and I thank God for this assignment. And <clears throat> I was just sitting back, and I didn't come around because I had a reflection of my grandmother who just passed back in November, and today would have been her 98th birthday. And as I sat there, I just started thinking how good God was to her. And also my my other grandmother, I believe she would have been 97 yesterday on the 8th. But I am um, just grateful to God for how my, grand, how my grandmother lived and how she's in me. And um, today I'm, I'm, I just want to give honor to God for that and to pastor and co-pastor and to all our ministers, to everyone under the sound of my voice. Um, I want um, everyone, in, before I stand, I'm sorry, y'all. That that kind of hit me. <sighs> Give me a moment, please. I'm going to ask everyone to please stand that can stand and turn your Bibles to Acts, the second chapter, verses 1 through 4 and 41 through 47. And before I I go there as something that I, while y'all searching for it, I didn't give honor to my wife and I never forget to do that when I'm ministering. My best friend and as she always say, my ride or die. My wife is my wife is my everything, and I thank God for her and my children and grandchildren and all our ministers. God bless you. Um, why are you um, going to? There's something that I need to say before I go into this message. Something that you need to know and understand that the presence of the Holy Spirit, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit, and that power is what enabled the early church to carry out. The gospel's message with such effectiveness that Peter just spoke a word to a lame man who was brought to the temple every day begging for uh, for money. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter into the temple, he asked them for some money. And Peter looked at him and said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the Bible says Peter took the man by his hand and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength and he was completely healed. Well, that's one great example of the power that was received of all of them that were in the upper room. Amen. So much happened, I can't give it all to you in one sermon, but I just thought I'd give you one example. Now we're going to read from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, 47 through 40, I mean 41 through 47. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And and there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, from verse 5 to 14, they start talking about how they were up in the room, and they were... um, uh, thought they were drunk and during the day and all this stuff. And then from verse 14 to, uh, to the end, you find out how Peter preached the first message to the church. Amen. But we're going to skip past Peter's message because we got a message to preach ourselves. Amen. So verse 41 through 47 says, Then they that gladly received the word were baptized. And the same day... There were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the gospel's doctrine and fellowship, 
and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. I give y'all one. And all the believers were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord. Somebody said the Lord. Lord. Added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Before you uh, sit down, before I pray, the subject I want to bring to you today is bring back. The Pentecost. Father, in the name of Jesus, as I stand, Father God, I pray that you would bless this word, bless your people. We thank you, Father God, for your word, realizing that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of your mouth. So now that my mouth's open, you proceed through me, so this word can be <clears throat> sent forth, God. Let it not return void, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bring back the Pentecost. My three points this morning. Number one, they that wait upon the Lord. Number two, a sound from heaven. And number three, bring back the Pentecost in that order. They that wait upon the Lord, a sound from heaven, and bring back to Pentecost. Glory to God. Hell, 50 days after the Passover, the Pentecost was also called a festival of harvest. It was one of the three major and annual festivals, according to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 16, 16, which says, each year, every man in Israel must celebrate these three festivals. Number one, the festival of unleavened bread. Number two, the festivals of harvest. And number three, the festivals of shelters. Well, they must appear before the Lord at the place he chose on each of these occasions. And they must bring a gift to the Lord. You see, those three times a year, every male was to make his, a journey to the sanctuary in the city that would be designated as Israel's religious capital. But listen to this. At these festival, festivals, each participant was encouraged to give what he could in proportion to what God had given him. Amen? You see... God, my brothers and sisters, does not expect us to give more than we can. Amen? But we will be blessed when we give cheerfully. Am I right about it? But listen, for some, 10% may be a burden. And for most of us, that would be perhaps too little. So, so look at what you have and give in proportion to what you have been given, as the scripture says, give and it shall come back to you. Press down, shaking together, and running over. Amen? You see, after the death of Jesus uh, Christ, the disciples were in Jerusalem for the feast of the Pentecost. And on that day, the Bible says the Holy Spirit of God came and indwelled and empowered them. Now, since then, every child of God are indwelt or baptized with the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. Can I get a witness? Now, 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 check this out. The Gospels open up the New Testament because they tell us about the main character of our faith, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Matthew, being the first of the gospel, gives us a more detailed description of Jesus Christ, the beginning of his life and his ministry. But meanwhile, 
Matthew had starts the beginning of the New Testament. Now, now listen to this. I heard some scholars mention, why was Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then John, should it have been Matthew, Mark, John, then Luke, being as though Luke wrote the uh, entire book of Acts, and he finished the book of Luke chapter 24, verses 53, which I want y'all, I want to, turn, want y'all to turn y'all Bibles to that. Amen. Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. Hallelujah. Are you with me? While some turn, and let me go on. It says, and he said unto them, speaking of Jesus, after the resurrection, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled that were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scripture. He said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye are endowed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed him, them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were, con- and, and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Now turn, turn back to Luke chapter 1, verses, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 1. Verses 3 through 8. Hallelujah. 4 through 8. Let's let's do 4. And it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which said he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized you with water. I'm sorry, baptized with water. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of, of, of Israel? He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The word of God is blessed. Amen. Amen. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the central fact of our Christian history. Am, am I right about it? On it, the church is built, and, and without it, there would be no Christian church today. Jesus' resurrection is quite unique. Other religions have strong ethical systems, concepts about paradise and the afterlife, and various holy scriptures. Now, 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 check this out. Only Christianity has a God who became human, literally died on a cross for his people, and was raised again in power and glory to rule his church forever. Hallelujah. Well, it seems to me that part of the church has lost its passion, has lost their enthusiasm coming to church. It used to be so exciting, I ain't talking about here, so exciting to the point We couldn't wait to get to church. And I don't know about you, but I couldn't wait to bash in the presence of the Lord. After all that God has done for me, after he has healed my brain surgery, and after he all that, I don't know about you, but after all he's done, I couldn't wait 
to get into his presence. Amen? To praise him and to honor him for all he has done for me. Like the writer of uh, Psalms 34, 1 and, and, and 3, he says, I will bless the Lord at all times. Let me put my finger right there because when I say at all times, when you start thinking about what God has done for you, where how he healed you, how he saved, how he uh, just made a way out of no way when you were broke, he put money in your pocket, when he, you were sick, he healed you. It's only by the grace of God that a lot of us are still alive. So I don't know about you, but I will bless him at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mind, my mouth. And the writer couldn't keep it to himself because in verse 3 he says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Are you with me? You see, God promises great blessings to his people. Am I right about it? But many of these blessings require our active participation. God will set us free from our fears, guard us and rescue us, and show us his goodness. Amen? He will supply all our needs and our wants. He'll even listen when we call upon him. He'll redeem us, but we must do our part in waiting and trusting him Knowing in due season, we will reap the harvest of blessing if we do not faint. Hallelujah. That's why it's imperative, my brothers and sisters, to wait upon the Lord. Because waiting on the Lord is the patient expectation, knowing that God will fulfill his promises in his word. Amen. And he will strengthen us. To rise above life difficulties. Waiting on the Lord simply means to completely trust God. Amen. But it seems as though in this millennial age that some folks don't like to wait. They want everything right now. Quick, fast, in a hurry. Instant, in a flash, at the blinking of an eye. In a split second. And most of them want it microwavable. And if God has promised you something, you don't have to, uh, if it, and you don't have it yet, then wait on God. And if God says wait, you must wait because they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. In Psalms 27 and 14, David tells us this, Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. You see, David knew from experience what it meant to wait on the Lord. He had been anointed as king at 16, but uh, 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 didn't fulfill his kingship until he was 30 years old. But during his interim, glory to God, he was chased uh, through the wilderness by the jealous king Saul. David, somebody say David, had to wait on God uh, for the fulfillment of the promises he to reign. Later, after becoming king, he was then chased uh, by his rebellious son, Absalom. My God, you see, waiting on God... No matter what it is, it's not easy. Am I right about it? Often it seems that uh, God isn't answering our prayers and doesn't understand uh, the urgency of our situations. And that kind of thinking uh, implies that God is not in control or is not fair. But... No matter how long it takes, glory to God, no matter the situation, if God has made a promise that he's going to bless you, if God has made a promise that he's going to heal you, then you need to know that God is worth waiting for. Hallelujah. Lamentations. 
3, 24 through 26 calls us to hope in and wait for the Lord. Because often God uses times of waiting to refresh, to renew, and to teach us. Can I get a witness? So make good use of your waiting, your waiting time by studying the word of God, uh, by praying uh, and by fasting. And also there are uh, by praying and fasting, glory to God, and doing the will of God because, hallelujah, if you don't do exactly what God says do, guess what? It'll take more time. Huh? Glory to God. Hallelujah. One day I'm going to preach about these notes, y'all. It's all good. So one thing we have to do is believe what God may be trying to do <clears throat> is teach us how to be patient. You see, Jesus had instructed his disciples to witness to people all over na- all over the nations about about him. Amen. According to Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But they were told to wait first for the Holy Spirit. Amen. God has important work for us to do Amen. for him. Amen. But you must do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Huh? You can't do this in your own strength. I don't know no preacher that can get up here in their own strength. If they are, they're showing off. But when, when, when God gives you something to say to the people, it's from God. Huh? So we often like to get on with the job, even if it means running ahead of God. And that happened, let me put my finger right there, to the first king that they wanted to govern them. And that was King Saul. God was governing them. God was taking care of them. He delivered them from bondage, brought them across the Red Sea, fed them, gave them the best, even was setting up the promised land for them to go in and possess it. They had to do nothing. But they wanted a king. Watch it. So watch what you want. Huh? I like that. Watch what you want. Because you might get what you want, and then later on you're going you're gonna wish you never got it. Huh? King Saul had one commission from Samuel, was to wait for him to do something that God wanted him to do with the Philistines. But he couldn't wait. And the Bible says it took Samuel seven days to get to him, but during the course of those seven days, the Bible says uh, Saul went on and did his own thing. And when Saul, when Samuel got to him, he said, you mean to tell me you could not wait for, the, for what I told you to do? You went on in your own strength and messed up? And because of him going in his own strength, the Bible says that God dethroned him and was setting up somebody else to take over as king of Israel, and that was David. So waiting on God is important. So, sometimes, part of God's plan is waiting. Am I right about it? You see, it was a blessing for all of those who were in the upper room waiting for the promises from God. And the Bible says they were with one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. As of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Can I, can I give y'all another one? This sound from heaven, my brothers and sisters, was so powerful that the people that heard it, because the Bible says faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. When they heard them up there speaking in different tongues, They thought the people up there were intoxicated. And that happens when we get filled with that same Holy Ghost. It's something about that Holy Ghost when God fills you up. You don't want to go back to former elements. When God fills you up. 
fills you with the Holy Ghost. You don't want to do things that you used to do. Hang out where you used to hang out. Do the things and say the things you used to say. No, God said, when I indwell you with the Holy Ghost, you're going to act different. You got to act like you are king's kid. You got to act like you are God's child because somebody ain't going to come up into this place. Somebody because of the, um, the, the, the Holy Spirit being with you are going to see you and want to be saved. Yeah. Well. Oh, my God. So, so listen, the sound from heaven. There are various sounds of heaven. And, and you need to know that the sound of heaven brings us immediately into the spirit. The sound of heaven should always be a sound of joy, celebration, and thanksgiving. You see, in many lives today, the common sound of heaven is a sound of complaining. If something doesn't go your way, if you're not happy with your job, if you're not happy at home, or perhaps even happy in the church, instead of casting that care on God, we begin to murmur and complain. Am I right about it? And there's a sound of confusion. There's a sound of despair. And there's a sound of frustration. In other words, there should always be a sound of gladness a sound of happiness and a sound of worship and a sound of praise. Because if it had not been for God who was on our side, where would we be today if it had not been for God? Glory to God. So we should always have that sound, something kind of song as we go back and we talk about the old hymns. We should always have Something deep down in our heart to sing and praise God for because of all he has done for us. Amen. Hallelujah. Psalms 22 and 3 tells us God inhabits the praises of his people. And where there's a praise, you'll find God in the atmosphere. Am I right about it? This is very important. Hallelujah. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, you'll find the victory. According to 2 Corinthians 3.17, we can tell in our observation when folk have a bad attitude of praise and worship. Let me put my finger right there because you'll find out that they sit down and fold their hands, put their head down, and, and, and they can't. Give God any praises because they feel sorry for themselves or where they are and what they're going through. But I came to tell somebody, it doesn't matter where you are and what you're going through. If you just praise the name of the Lord, changes will come. Your blessings will come. Am I right about it? you got to praise the name of the Lord. So, so it's during those times. When we see them operating much more in the flesh rather than in the spirit. So, so here's another sound of heaven. It's a sound that brings us before the throne of God. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus is standing at the door and knocking and promises to come in his presence. To those who open the door. Amen. In response to Revelations 4 and 1, Jesus now has the door of heaven open and invites in those who had previously invited him into their hearts. Oh, y'all getting quiet up on me now. You see, when we open the doors for Jesus to come into our lives, he in turn opens the door for us to come into his kingdom. Amen? And because of the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross. We are now able to come boldly before the throne of God that we might obtain mercy and find grace in this time of need. Am I right about it? So everything we could ever have and everything we could ever need of can be found at the throne of God. Furthermore, a sound of heaven brings declaration of holiness of God. 
You see, by God's very nature, God is holy. Amen? And all of creation declares his holiness. And we find here a three-time declaration of God's holiness in Revelations 4, 1 through 4. I believe it says, and the angels are around the throne of God shouting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty, which is, which was, and is to come. Can I get a witness? So listen, the sound of heavenly worship expressed here is, just saying, God, we give the honor. God, we give you glory. And the essence is in declaring that God is worthy of all glory and all honor. Am I right about it? Well. You see, Jesus warned in Matthew 15 and 8 about honoring God with our lips while our hearts are far from him. You see, God is delighted when we choose to genuinely worship him. And worship, my brothers and sisters, is a choice. I'm almost there, y'all. We have been given a free will, amen, and God's desire is that we worship him. But we have that choice. But, whoo, glory, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, God made his presence known to his gospel believers in the upper room in a spectacular way. The violent wind, the fire, and the Holy Spirit. How would you like God to reveal himself to you in such a recognizable way? Think about that. Huh? Because he may do it so, but be wary of forcing your expectations on God. Well. In 1 Kings 19, 10-13, Elijah also needed a message from God. There was a great wind and then an earthquake and finally a fire. But God's message came in a gentle whisper. Well. Glory to God. It came with a whisper. You see, God may use dramatic methods uh, to work in your life. Or, or he may speak a gentle whisper. Am I right about it? So the best thing we can do is wait patiently and always listen. Glory to God. The last sound from heaven brings out a heart of submission to the authority of God. The four creatures uh, falling before God show that he was in supreme authority. Amen. And a heart of worship is one that is constantly bowed before the authority of the Lord. Then the four creatures laying their crowns before the throne represents the submission to our God. So no matter what we have achieved in this life, it all comes from the Father. Everything we have is in God. Everything we've become came from God. Everything that we hope for or hope to be is in God. Outside of God, we are no thing. And we will have no thing. He is God. He is our provider. He is our sustainer. He is our hope. He is our way maker. He is our joy. He is our peace. Glory to God. He is our deliverer. He is our God. And He is worthy to be praised. And if you don't know that God is worthy, somebody needs to shout yeah. Shout yeah. Because our God is an awesome God. Our God is the greatest Father in all the world. That's why we need to bring back the Pentecost. Huh? Where we were excited to be in church. That's why we need to bring back the Pentecost when we didn't mind giving to the needy and not to the greedy. We need to bring back the Pentecost when we were excited when God blessed your neighbor. You need to understand that he's in the neighborhood ready to bless you. That's why we need to Bring back the Pentecost. My God. Like they 
they did back then. And 3,000 souls, I can imagine, were excited to come at one time to the Lord. We need to bring back to Pentecost where we had love that touched from heart to heart and breast to breast. We need to bring back the Pentecost where we had the real love, the agape love, not a pseudo love that I want to give you, but agape that's real and that's gentle. Amen. We need to bring back the Pentecost where we had love and compassion for one another. We need to bring back the Pentecost where we find peace in the midst of our storms. We need to bring back the Pentecost where we find joy in the midst of sorrows. We need to bring back the Pentecost where there's hope for our tomorrows. We need to bring back the Pentecost when there was long suffering, then came the victory. We need to bring back the Pentecost when we were patient and kind to one another. We need to bring back the Pentecost of when the choices we made were good, gentle, and it's with self-control. We need to bring back the Pentecost where we had the faith in God. No matter how long it took, our faith in God assures us that all who honestly seek Him, who act in faith on the knowledge of God, that 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 we will possess, possess rather, and we will be rewarded. Can I get a witness? So like all those who were endowed with the power of the Holy Ghost uh, became great witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. When we tell others the good news and encourage them to be honest and diligent in their search for the truth, those who hear the good news uh, are responsible responsible for what they have seen and heard. So bring back the Pentecost. Hallelujah. Bring it back. And when we do, there wouldn't be any jealousy. There wouldn't be no envy. There wouldn't be no hate. Especially over material possessions. When we bring back the Pentecost, my brothers and sisters, there will be joy, love, peace, meekness, gentleness, Amen. kindness, well. faithfulness, a new life with Jesus Christ, a great fe- fellowship with all believers, a glorious future. For Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, I know the thoughts and the plans I have for you. They're not disastrous. It's going to give you a future and hope. I'm going to close with this saying I found on the internet. And it's amazing. My wife testified, and believe me, she didn't know my notes. I'll never let her see what I'm, I'm preaching. She'll never I'll let me see. <laughs> but it says, God said no. Okay. Okay. Come on. I asked God to take away my habits. God said, no, it It is not for me to take it away, but it's for you to give it up. I asked God to make my handicapped child whole. God said, no, his spirit is whole and his body is only temporary. I asked God to grant me patience. God said, no, patience is a byproduct of tribulation. It isn't granted, it is learned. I asked God to give me happiness. God said, no, I'll give you blessings. Happiness is up to you. I asked God to spare me pain. God said, no, suffering draws you apart from worldly cares and brings you closer to me. I asked God, To make my spirit grow. God said no. You must grow on your own. But I'll prune you. To make you fruitful. I asked God. For all things. That I might enjoy life. God said no. I will give you life. So that you may enjoy. All things. 
I ask God to help me love, here it is, others as much as you love me. God said, aha. Finally, you have the eye there. And I added to the sand, I asked God to bring back the Pentecost that's filled with love, joy, peace, and happiness that's full of many, many blessings. And you know what God said? Yes. If you seek ye first the kingdom of God and my righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Bring back the Pentecost, my brothers and sisters.